Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Learn GSP with Mahesh. So today what we'll do is we'll try to complete the practice exam. So Cloud Architect, in Google Cloud Architect, there's a practice exam which comes up with almost like uh, 23 static questions. Why I mean by static is the same question. Even if you take n number of times, the same question is going to come. So but these questions are really good to know because it gives you an idea what kind of questions you need to, uh, you may be expecting. Um, and uh, off late what I have seen, uh, this is this could be a, just a coincidence or uh, I'm fortunate enough. What I have seen is uh, when I took my network engineering certification, one of the e practice exam question came in my real exam. So if you're fortunate enough, maybe the same thing applies for your cloud architect also. So but this is just a coincidence or I'm fortunate enough. I'm not sure. So so it's always a good practice uh, and this should be the last step once you finish all your activity like uh, whatever the official course material, uh, add-on materials, whatever you see, and also some of my YouTube channel uh, videos. If you look into all those things, this should be your final stage so that it will give you a understanding what is your level of understanding. So that's the stuff. So let's try to demystify all the practice exam questions. So and I'm going to plan it as two different uh, set of videos. One, uh, straightforward questions, and second, like a uh, beginners and intermediate kind of questions we will discuss it now and a difficult or an expert level questions we will discuss it uh, or expert or something like much difficult questions we'll discuss it in uh, another video so let's get started so the first question is uh, which we had already discussed in our practice uh, so but for the completeness sake let's again discuss this question so the first question is because you are, for this case study you need to refer to uh, Theramath's case, uh, case study because you you don't know every possible future use of the data Theramath want uh, collects you have decided to build a system that captures and stores all the raw data all the raw data in case uh, you need it later so what do you mean by all the raw data so if you just go to the case study and if you look into Theramath's case study what you will realize that is that two types of data they are trying to capture so almost they have 20, 20 million uh, vehicles and uh, each vehicle is generating almost like 120 fields per second and almost like 200 K vehicles are connected to cellular network 3G or 4G or 5G whatever the network and they are generating almost like 9 terabytes of data so the complete set if you see 20 million vehicles so some few data are almost like real-time data streaming and some few data are batch data so what they are saying is they want to store all the raw data whether it is streaming data, batch data, whatever it is, it has to be stored. And you, how can you most cost effectively accomplish this task? The cost effectively, this is the most important word and all the raw data. These are the most important keywords which you need to keep in mind when you are choosing the right answer. Now let's go to the options. So first option, uh, have the vehicle in the field, stream the data directly to BigQuery. So, immediately what strikes you is uh, this option uh, does not suit well there are a couple of reasons why uh, this does not suit well is if you want to stream it we know that only 200k vehicles are connected to cellular and the remaining vehicles are still connected to still connected to uh, like you need to connect to the maintenance port and do the analysis so you cannot do this part if you want to stream it. That is one point number one why that does not work well. And another reason is um, if you want to stream data into BigQuery, uh, which I had discussed in the previous video also, uh, the Theramath's practice question, the quota limit when you're streaming the data, it is almost like 100K. But we know the vehicles which are connected to internet is already 200K. So you will definitely run out of the limit so definitely this is not going to work well so option a gets ruled out let's move on to option b have vehicles in the field pass the data to cloud pubsub and dump dump it into a data proc cluster that stores data in hadoop uh, distributed file system on persistent disk i would say pubsub is definitely a good choice if you want to stream it at least for the small amount of data uh, but stream, uh, persistent disk is something which strikes, which needs to strike you uh, because a persistent disk, the maximum volume of a persistent disk is 64 terabytes. 
and if you look into Taramath case study, uh, one day itself only this part, the vehicles which are connected to internet, they themselves generate nine terabytes per day. So 64 terabytes would be easily finished in maybe in in a week's time. So definitely that's going not going to be a good choice with the volume. So B gets ruled out. Moving on to option C. So here it's slightly different. Uh, have vehicles in the field uh, continue to dump the data via FTP, adjust the Linux, uh, existing Linux machine and use a collector to upload them into Google Data Proc HDFS for storage. So here if you see they just mentioned to Data Proc for storage. Uh, they have not mentioned whether it is persistent disk or something else. So even in the previous video, I would have showed like uh, told right. Uh, the hidden uh, secret is data proc behind the scene uses Google Cloud storage for storing purpose. But in this case, they had explicitly mentioned they want persistent disk. That's the reason it was ruled out. But if they don't mention anything like that, it is still using Google Cloud storage behind the scene. Then you may say it's a good thing. Store Google Cloud storage does not have any limit. Uh, capacity limit so we can store it easily but a question which you need to think is cost effective if you just want to store it for future purpose uh, if you are like a future analysis like to store it why do you want a data proc there why don't you simply store it in google cloud storage so that way if data proc was not there definitely i would have gone with this option itself so that's the reason option c gets ruled out Moving on to the option D, since A, B, C, D were already ruled, uh, A, B, C were already ruled out, definitely the answer should be D, but let's still look whether it is a right candidate or not. Have the vehicles in the field continue to dump data via FTP, so far so good. Adjust the uh, existing Linux machine to immediately upload it to Google Cloud Storage with GSUtil. Looks like a feasible option and whether it is streaming data or whether it is batch data, you if you reach FTP, Everything could be then moved to Google Cloud Storage. Primarily, if they need it for future purpose, what I would suggest is uh, maybe a cold line uh, storage bucket would be a better choice. So option D is the right answer. So let's move on to the next one. Moving on to the next question. Uh, this again was discussed in the practice two question. So it would be a repeat, but for the completeness, let's go through it. Today, again for this, it's Teramath's case study. Today, Teramath maintenance worker received interactive uh, performance graphs, performance graphs for the last 24 hours, almost like uh, 86,400 uh, events uh, by plugging their maintenance tablet to the vehicle. So, uh, to the vehicle, when they plug in the the, tab, the device into the vehicle's maintenance port, they will get to know that. The support group wants uh, support technicians to view this data remotely to help remote uh, to help remote uh, so to help uh, troubleshoot problems. You want to minimize the latency of the graph loading. So latency is the most important thing. I would say it should be loading up fast because there's a huge amount of data. You need to load that read part. That has to be pretty much quick. How would you achieve this functionality? And the first question uh, option. Execute the query uh, against uh, data stored in clouds equal. And if you see, this is primarily more of a read option. They are reading the data uh, to understand what is the problem there. It is more of analytics. And Google Cloud, uh, Cloud SQL is a OLTP system, online transactional posting system. And uh, it's not good for OLAP systems, like online analytical processing systems. So usually big data, sorry, big table, big query would be a good choice there. And another reason why I don't go with uh, Cloud SQL is the volume of data. We know of late, uh, Google has increased the, the limit of Google Cloud, uh, Cloud SQL uh, instance from 10 terabyte to 30, but still that's peanuts for Teramert's volume of data. So that's not going to fly there. So you will have a volume restriction and you will not, it's not a good design to use a SQL Cloud SQL for a analytical purpose. So that's the reason option A gets ruled out. Moving on to option B, where it says that execute the queries against the data indexed by vehicle underscore ID dot timestamp in cloud big table. So this one, it's nothing but your row key. And they're saying execute the query against this, you should be able to get the lowest latency. 
looks like a possible choice because the volume definitely big table can handle it and if you choose the right row key definitely this is also possible if you look into the screen of big table uh, you will see the reads and the writes you can get consistent 6 millisecond uh, reads and writes so whatever be the volume of data so it can read almost like if with three nodes it can read almost like 30,000 rows at 6 milliseconds so consistent uh, reads and writes so that's the the beauty so which will definitely support this latency part so looks like a so looks like a B is a potential candidate so but anyway let's park it and let's go option C and see whether anything better is there execute the queries against uh, data stored on daily partitioned BigQuery table definitely looks like a choice because whatever they want is past 24 data past 24 hours data and if we partition the data by day definitely you should be able to uh, query this uh, again looks like a potential candidate B and C still looks like a possible choice let's go to D and then come back with the tiebreaker option D execute the queries again uh, big query with data stored in cloud storage via BigQuery Federation so I had already shown that in this video so you can look into that video what does this mean so usually the data resides in your storage Google Cloud storage and you are querying it via your BigQuery so this is called as Federation so cost wise if the, if the question was more towards cost effective thing definitely I would have gone with this option because you are storing it in the cheapest storage in Google that is your Google Cloud storage but the question is not cost but it is more towards the latency so if you are reading it from Google Cloud Storage definitely the latency would be very very long so D and A gets ruled out totally it is now between your B and C and if you see the most important thing is I would say both of them can definitely do that so when it comes to the latency part BigQuery may not be able to give that latency which Bigtable can give you so definitely it will be a uh, big table the the latency we have seen this in the screen 6 millisecond and it is very consistent so definitely big table takes a priority and the only drawback with big table is it is a NoSQL database so you need to write something in a Apache edge based API to query the data and show it but if it was in big query definitely it is a SQL it's very easy so option B is the right answer let's move on to the next question so this question will park it as the difficult part of the expert question so let's skip this for today and let's discuss it in the next video moving on to the next uh, question which should be uh, pretty much a straightforward thing again this is based on Theramath case study which of the Theramath's legacy enterprise process will experience a significant change as a result of cloud adoption Google Cloud uh, platform adoption so it's a very straightforward thing so uh, capacity planning if you see uh, the amount of uh, data which they're generating and it's totally a big data problem uh, that's what we understand uh, into the, when we look into the case study itself so uh, definitely it is more of uh, what will uh, have a significant change is the capacity planning uh, total uh, cost of ownership and capital and uh, the operational expenditure and the ca capital expenditure allocation option B is a straightforward answer I would say so this would have a major uh, change when they move to cloud so option B is the right answer there so it's not much technical here it's more of uh, wearing the business hat when you are handling such questions it's nothing much technical here moving on to the next question uh, so in this uh, again this is on uh, Theramath's case study so if you look into this case study uh, sorry in this question you analyze Theramath's business requirement to reduce the downtime and found that you can achieve the majority of the time saving by reducing the customers wait time for the spare parts you decided to focus on the reduction of three weeks aggregate reporting time which modification to a company's process would uh, should you recommend here so the whole intent if you look into the case study uh, their main problem is they want to reduce the uh, this one reduce unplanned downtime uh, from three weeks to one week so if you see uh, 
will be waiting for four weeks almost so you want to reduce this to one week so that's one of the main thing so if you want to do that part what is a major part thing which you will take into consideration so here if you see uh, you need to predict it that's a key the, the crux of this question is like how can you predict things whether a device or sorry or a, whether a vehicle will be for going for maintenance or may get a breakdown in the next 15 days so if you do some kind of a machine learning stuff a predictive analysis then you will be able to predict it and also you can have the stocks in your inventory well in advance so that the vehicles are not uh, waiting for spare parts that's the key part here so if you look into option a option b and option d they are primarily talking about changing the formats and the protocol to transfer the data but for machine learning the the main important thing is uh, a data scientist will definitely say this very very clearly the volume of the data is important more the data you give more the fresh data you give and more real-time data you give the system will be able to learn things from it so more the data better the good data good quality data definitely it will be able to predict it what could go wrong for you to get more data if you can increase so if you see currently there are only like 200k vehicles connected to internet if you make this number more more data are coming in real time or near real time to the system so running a predictive analysis is much much easier there so that's the reason why if you increase the fleet cellular connectivity to up to 80 percent and follow the same process from FTP to streaming uh, uh, transport and develop a machine learning analysis this will help you reduce the wait time of the vehicle of the vehicles waiting for spare parts so option C is the right choice let's move on to the next question so the next question is your company wants to deploy several microservices to help their system handle elastic load so it should be up and down you should be able to handle that scale up scale down so that is the thing each microservice each microservice uses a different version of the software libraries meaning let's just for example let's just take uh, two microservices. one microservice may be using uh, java 8 version another microservice may be using uh, java 7 simple example or if people don't understand java just an example if one microservice is using uh, image magic uh, 1.2 version and another uh, microservice using image magic 1.3 version so there are different libraries you so so they use different even though it is the same uh, software but the versions are different you want to enable the uh, enable the developer to keep their development environment in sync with the production service this is the most important thing because if you don't do this have been a developer so there's always and have been a cloud architect also so i know that the developers always use a standard dialog saying that it works in my laptop it works my in my machine i don't know why it does not work in production the whole reason is you are not packaging all your dependencies so if you are packaging all the dependencies and creating a container image there is a hundred percent chance it is going to work in every environment development qa product uh, staging and production so that is the beauty of container so that's what even without looking into the option looking into those things what i feel is a container is a good choice which technology should you use so if you look into this rpm and uh, dot deb which is usually the os packages where you want to install certain softwares it may not be a good choice because the syncing part will not be there you cannot sync it you cannot keep it sync between dev and production so that's the reason it gets ruled out containers as i mentioned that's the one which is ruling the current uh, business now so if you do this there's always an advantage of moving it to uh, syncing it with dev to production and also it's not only with gcp you can also deploy the container in other cloud also so that's a good choice and looking into option c and d if you see option c it is more like puppet and chef which is a infrastructure as a code or a configuration management tool very much similar to our deployment manager uh, definitely it is helpful for creating your infrastructure but this is more towards the the workload 
how do you sync it so that is where containers comes into picture virtual machines definitely will not be able to solve this that's the reason why containers evolved so option b is the right answer let's move on now moving on to the next question so your moving on to the next question your company wants to track uh, whether someone in, is present in a in a meeting room uh, reserved for scheduling a meeting uh, there are almost like 1000 uh, meeting rooms across five uh, office in three continent each room is equipped with a motion sensor that uh, reports its status every second you want to support the data upload and collection each uh, need needs of this sensor network receiving the infrastructure the receiving infrastructure needs to account for the responsibility for the possibility that the device may have inconsistent connectivity the receiving infrastructure needs to account for the possibility that the device may have inconsistent connectivity meaning the device sometimes may go offline can come online so so that is a key here um, which solution would you uh, design it so here if you see it is basically an iot kind of a Uh, requirement where there's a motion sensor which detects if there's no nobody in the room maybe the uh, in the next few minutes the room can be allocated to somebody else so that's primarily that uh, meeting room management trying to achieve that and the key here is sometimes a device may go the connectivity could be a problem so it can come down it can come up so immediately when you see something of that sort iot and some inconsistent stuff the main thing which strikes me without looking so this is what you should also try to follow uh, like uh, don't always look with the option a b c and then try to choose it if when you look into the question itself what and all component should strike you so it should be something like iot core pub sub because pub sub uh, the option is the data could be pushed if the subscriber is down also the data could be retained for 7 days so that's something very very helpful so a loosely coupled system uh, more like a messaging service so that something which strikes me um, without looking into the options now let's go to the options have each uh, each device create a consistent connection to a compute engine instance and write messages to a custom application so they're talking about uh, compute engine here um, so to handle all this part so let's hold on to it let's see is there any better choice so have device option b uh, have devices poll for the connectivity to cloud sql and insert the latest message on a regular interval to a device specific table uh, a rule of thumb is whenever you are handling something with uh, iot kind of devices where there is uh, uh, like uh, very huge writes possible using an ol uh, oltp system is not a good choice using something like big table is a good choice so because of cloud sql i will definitely rule it out and a we have not come to a conclusion i have just parked it so rule that off we are just looking for some better solutions going to option c have devices poll for connectivity to pub sub looks like a good choice because a pub sub has that capability of Uh, achieving that uh, inconsistent connectivity so even if you are connected not connected come up later when you are connected you just just get disconnected for 10 minutes and you come up again pubsub can still handle that you don't need the system to be always live so that is something a good choice and publish the latest message on regular intervals to a shared public to a shared topic to all the devices looks like a potential option there uh, pubsub is handling the major part of this that was a major requirement have uh, inconsistent connectivity so using pub sub definitely it can achieve that let's see is there any better choice have devices uh, create a persistent connection to a app engine function front end by cloud endpoints each ingest messages and write them to data store so the now the problem again is between your a and d the problem is how they are going to handle uh, inconsistency inconsistent connectivity that's never been mentioned here but we know that if it's pub sub it's very very damn easy with it because the subscriber can go down any time it can come up so as long as you are pushing it to the queue the subscriber can come up any time and you can 
get the message and do the next level of processing so that's the reason why um, option C is a better fit in this case so let's mark option C let's go ahead to the next question Moving on to the next question, your company wants to wants to try out cloud with low risk. That's always the best option. They don't want to take any risk uh, because uh, if it fails, there are few organization, uh, not few, many organization who don't want to go into cloud itself. So they always want to play a safer game. They want to archive approximately uh, 100 terabytes of their log to the cloud and test the analytics feature available to them there, there in the sense cloud while also retaining the data for a long-term DR backup. What are the first two steps you should take? Uh, there are two options. You need to use, a, there's a checkbox here, it's not a radio button. So the two things here is the volume of the data. That's one important thing, 100 terabytes. So you need to look for products which can support that volume of data. And you want to do analytics on this log information. Plus, you also want to retain it for a longer time, a backup data. So if you see all those things, what does that strike? The volume is there, analytics is there. And if you look into one of the, the YouTube videos which had created the keyword matching, that video says, if you see analytics, huge volume, BigQuery is a good choice. And they want to store the data for a longer uh, time, long term. Cloud storage, Google Cloud storage with Primarily, to be very specific, a cold line storage class would be a better fit in this case. Without looking into the options, these are the things which strikes me. So let's look into the options. Load the data, uh, load the log into BigQuery. So definitely, if you do that, there's a high chance that you can do analytics on uh, 100 terabytes of data. Looks like a good option. Load the logs into Cloud SQL. Any option of the Cloud SQL, meaning Postgres, MySQL, uh, or the latest one, which is in beta, uh, SQL Server. The key here is it's not going to work here. The reason is we know the upper limit of the Cloud SQL is only 30 terabytes. Let me show you that quickly. All right, I'm in my Cloud Console. So let me choose MySQL uh, for the simplicity reason. And you can try with Postgres also. There's no harm there. And the most important thing here is if you click on the, the the storage part where you can see this part you will see uh, the maximum limit which you can go is you see this previously it was 10 terabytes now they have made it to 30 terabytes but if you look into the option the question is 100 terabytes we are definitely falling short of the volume there so that's the reason option B gets ruled out Moving on to the next option, import logs into stack driver. What will you do if you import the logs into stack driver? You can just retain it for audit purpose, but you cannot do an analytics. So that does not make any sense. This is primarily for monitoring purpose. Definitely option C gets ruled out. Going on to the next option, insert logs into big table. Definitely volume wise, I would say big table can uh, fulfill that requirement. But the problem here is when do you use big table? Only when it is a time series kind of a data and you have a low latency requirement, something like the previous example, six milliseconds kind of a stuff. If you have such things, definitely big table is a good choice. But here, that's not the requirement. You just need to do analytics. They have never mentioned, I want to get the report in next few seconds, few milliseconds. So between big query and big table, whenever you don't have any latency requirement, go for big query because it's more serverless. You don't need to do any management, but big table you need to provision the resource it's more like a managed service there uh, so that's the reason don't go with big table in that situations wherever you see there's no latency tight latency requirement so again uh, big table gets uh, removed and another reason why usually i don't go with big table is it's a nosql database you need cannot you cannot do analytics on a nosql database if you don't know how to do edge based querying but if you know SQL, and if you have inserted all the data in BigQuery, simple, you can use your SQL statement to query it and also visualize it very easily on any BI tool. So that's the reason it goes off here. And they have not mentioned anything about the latency. That's the reason I'm not taking BigTable. And the last option, which should be definitely the possible option because we have ruled out all the things, 
upload the log into Google Cloud Storage. So that is for your long term uh, DR recovery, uh, long term DR backup. So preferably I would make sure it is stored in cloud line, uh, sorry, cold line uh, storage class. So A and E are the options. Let's move on to the next option question. So an interesting question. Um, you have set up uh, an auto scaling instance group to serve traffic for an upcoming launch. After configuring the instance groups as the backend service to a HTTPS load balancer, you notice that the virtual machine instance have been terminated and relaunched every minute. The instance does not have a public IP address and you have verified the appropriate web response is coming from each instance using the curl command. So the virtual machines does not have public IP address so you cannot access it via public IP address but you can use internal IP address RFC 1918 standard. You can log in and try to uh, use the curl command and they are giving the response. What, to indi that, what that, that indicates is the applications are running fine. Uh, but there's something between the load balancer and the instance group, something is not working. Why? That's the reason every time, every minute, the virtual machines are getting uh, terminated and a new uh, instance is getting created. Uh, you want to ensure the backend is configured correctly. What would you do? So instead of me explaining all the options, what I thought is let me, why don't I do a quick demo on load balancer with the instance group. Assume there's an instance group already configured. What are the steps which you usually do when you're configuring the load balancer? Let's try to do that. So click on the hamburger menu, go to your networking. Under networking, you will have uh, something called as network services. Select your load balancing. And in the question they have mentioned, it is a, uh, an HTTPS load balancer, which is a global load balancer. So very straightforward, uh, no rocket science there. This is what they are trying to configure. Let's click on start configuration and the request would be definitely because HTTPS, it has to be coming from your internet. And here, what you will do is we'll try to configure our backend services. So when you try to configure the backend service, the two back types of backend service, which is possible is your instance group or it could be a bucket. Bucket is usually for your CDN purpose, but in this case, it's your managed instance group. Let's try to create a backend service and we don't have a instance group. So assume we have it for a minute. So you can just add it. And the most important thing for you to do is the health check. This is the most important thing because the managed instance group can, let me just, why don't I put a new tab and show you that. When you show the managed instance group, usually you will have a health check also configured there because managed instance group can do auto scaling plus they can also do auto healing. How they do auto healing is basically using the health check. So let me show you where you configure the health check for a managed instance group. So if I just go to instance groups, Click on uh, create instance group and make sure I select manage instance group. So I have selected manage instance group. If you come here, you will have a health check. And when you're provisioning your load balancer also, the health check will be there. This health check and that health check should be the same. So when you try to configure the health check, there will be a specific port on which your application would be listening on. For example, port 80 in this case for the simplicity reason. If you have not opened up this port, the firewall, uh, you have not created the firewall rule for opening port 80, definitely the health check will try uh, like every uh, one minute. That's what they mentioned. So timeout. So they will try to do every time, uh, like every one minute, it will try to hit and see the response is not getting because the port is not open. So it will get a page not found or some other uh, custom error. And based on that error, what it will do is it will assume the instance is down, the virtual machine is down. So it will do a auto healing, meaning it will recreate a, uh, create a new instance. And after one minute, again, a health check, uh, a heartbeat will go and it will see again, it is not reachable. So it will be a, uh, it, it's like an infinite loop where it keeps on doing it, but the firewall rule is a problem here. So health check, firewall rule, all goes hand in hand. If something is, if your firewall rule is not there, 
health check will continuously fail so that is the key here so with all those explanation um, you can look into all the options and the straightforward option is if you just look into the help uh, the firewall rule you should be able to resolve this issue and why not other options if you look into this part the first option ensure the firewall rule exists to source the traffic on HTTPS to each to reach the load balancer the question is not towards the load balancer uh, issue but the question is more towards the virtual machine so make sure you resolve the virtual machine problem not the load balancer stuff so that is the stuff here so that's the reason why that gets ruled out option a then option B, assign a public IP address to each instance and configure the firewall rule to allow load balance to reach the uh, instance public IP address. So this is not a good choice. So because when you make it public, it becomes more uh, security vulnerabilities are there. So that's the reason they want don't want it to do it. We are going against it. That's the reason option uh, B gets ruled out. And the last option where create a tag on each instance with the name of the load balancer configure the firewall rule with the name of the load balancer as a source and the instance uh, tag as a firewall so whenever you do any demos on instance group with load balancer and with the firewall rules all those stuffs what you can figure out that is uh, the firewall rule and even the cloud armor i would have talked about cloud armor the firewall rule is always for your virtual machines it's not for your load balancer just keep that in mind if you want to have a firewall rule for your load balancer that's your cloud armor so that's the reason D gets ruled out so option C is the right answer let's move on to the next question moving on to the next question your organization has a three-tier uh, web application deployed in the same network same VPC on Google Cloud platform each tier web tier API tier database tier scales independently of the others so that's a good option good architecture network traffic should flow from web to API and then from API to database so traffic should not flow between web and database tier so the web tier should not be able to contact the database tier directly so it should be only via your API tier how do you configure it so simple straightforward options if you can control it via the firewall rule should be all good because it's in the same network so if it's the same network there are two things which is common the network you don't need to do anything with the network there it's already there and the routes whenever you create a network the routes gets automatically created and the last option which is left over is your firewall rule so if you need to play around with the firewall rule everything could be resolved so that's the key here so add each tier to a different sub network this is not going to fly uh, because if you uh, the firewall rule is the most important thing here so even if you make it in a different sub networks the, if you have not controlled the right firewall rule web can directly interact with your database so they are not even talking about anything on firewall rule so that's the reason why option a gets ruled out straightforward set up a software uh, based firewall rules on individual machines for people who don't understand what is a software based firewall rule so uh, at least from the windows perspective if you are using windows uh, machines windows 2012 or 2019 servers um, usually you will have a software based uh, firewall rule right where you can open up the uh, control panel and allow firewall rule deny the ports all those things those are things but the only thing is that uh, here the complexity is increasing the reason why it is increasing is if you see here they scale up independently the more the instances comes up I'm not sure how you are going to provision that software based firewall rule there that's another problem when it comes to scalability if it's one virtual machine you can definitely do it manually go and turn it off and uh, and also it's a cost definitely so that's the reason option uh, B gets ruled out moving on to the next option add tax to each tier and set up routes to allow the desired traffic flow as I mentioned in the beginning of the uh, question itself the network and the route is already created you don't need to do anything extra so you don't need to modify your route itself so and the tag whenever you do it 
it's only for your firewall rules there's no tag for a route let's just see that quickly by looking into the uh, firewall rules here so let me just close this and if you just go to your VPC and see the routes try to create a new route you will not see a, a tag there so click on routes so if you try to click on create routes uh, you will see uh, it is more of what is your next hop what is your destination IP address that's what they usually okay instance tag okay they have an instance tag here but usually the best practice is whenever you create a network the route is already there modifying the network there uh, modifying the routes a custom route may not be it would be an extra effort I would say that is one more reason and uh, always and if you see uh, this is not a mandatory field the instance tag so that's one thing and uh, if you see one more reason why this route option does not work is uh, usually if if you see the next hop it can be either in this case uh, it can be either an IP address or the instance name itself that's the thing but the proposed solution if you want to do play around with tags you will not be able to do that so that's the reason why that gets ruled out and if you come to the last option definitely uh, because a b c is already ruled out uh, d should be a good choice so let's look into that uh, still add tags to each tier and set up a firewall rule to allow the desired traffic so you can set up a firewall rule and with the tag so let me just show you that firewall rule so if you just create a firewall rule here you can mention the tag so you can mention the tag so like something like from web if it's coming if the request is coming from web you can just mention it as web tier and uh, these any request coming from the web tier will be able to uh, that will be allowed in your API uh, tier similarly uh, if you want to open up any ports uh, to connect to your uh, database tier it has to be only from your API tier so that's how you can manage it and uh, since the web cannot directly connect is because the tag is not there so that's the option if they have asked something more secure option what I would have suggested is just uh, since we had talked about firewall rule what I would usually use is I usually use a server uh, like service account that's a better choice um, from the more security perspective so option D is the right choice here more playing around with the tax with your firewall rule moving on to the next question uh, which is a straightforward one your organization has almost like a, not almost has five terabytes of private data on premise you need to migrate the data to uh, Google Cloud storage you want to maximize the data transfer speed how would you migrate the data so straightforward question if you look into it we can straightforwardly remove a couple of options right away uh, Google Cloud C uh, G Cloud we know whenever you want to interact with storage it has to be using your GS util maybe use GS util or use a rest API so that's the option so option B gets ruled out because of that and another option which gets ruled out directly uh, from the first scan itself is st storage transfer service what is this tra storage transfer service so if we just quickly go through it so if you go to this transfer service option uh, you will realize that it is only available for uh, limited options so it's not available for every option so if you just uh, try to create a job what you'll realize that is you can use this transfer service option only from one Google Cloud storage bu bucket to another storage bucket from uh, AWS S3 bucket to Google Cloud storage bucket or a list of URLs public which is tab separated uh, to Google Cloud storage bucket but what is the question here it is from on-premise so meaning transfer service totally gets ruled out so now it's between your GS util and your rest API GS uh, GS REST APIs these are two options simple straightforward I would say GS util was a better choice why it is a better choice I wanted to say that in uh, 
in couple of uh, maybe by showing a, a couple of documents here the first document which I wanted to share is uh, the gsutil copy command which using which you can copy the data from on-premise to GCP and the most important thing in this case is uh, if you see uh, it's a huge amount of data um, and definitely there will be files which is more than uh, uh, 8 megabytes so it's better to use something called as uh, resumable transfer so say for example if you are uploading a, a 150 MB of file and if it if the network fails in between the on-premise network fails in between it does not make sense to start it from again from the scratch but if you use this uh, resumable transfer option it would be a better choice it will save you the bandwidth there and here you if you want to enable that option you don't need to do anything extra it is inbuilt in GSUtil so that's what it indicates which is a good option but when it comes to your REST API option um, you have two options where you need to mention in the endpoint whether you want a resumable uploads or a simple multi-part upload so you need to make sure well in advance what kind of option you want and uh, if you start with it you may need to uh, give up some bandwidth trick there could be some issues when you are say for example if there's any issue and you want to do transfer using resumable you need to switch it so there's always a, a good amount of effort which you need to spend and also when you are using this uh, rest api to transfer the data you need to build something there's nothing out of the box ready made but if you are using gsutil option it's a command line utility uh, written using Python. You can just download just the gsutil command and you can trans start using the transfer options or the, the copy option. So that's something I would say out of the box. So nobody wants to develop something from the scratch. So in that perspective, I would say like uh, gsutil is more robust than the uh, gs uh, rest api option. So that's the reason option A is a good choice. So moving on to the next question. So the next question is uh, you are designing okay this is a slightly a difficult uh, thing so what we'll do is we'll just park this for our next video uh, so I'll, I just wanted to do a comprehensive demo on this so just parking this question moving on to the next question which is more of a security related question you are designing a large uh, large distributed application with uh, 30 microservices huge amount of microservices and everybody is towards uh, these days are with microservices you need to follow the best practices there each of your distributed microservice needs to connect to a database backend so there's a front end written in some language uh, maybe java dot net ruby on rails whatever it is uh, those are the microservices and they connect to the the database and usually when they connect to the database what is the usual way you will have a connection string and this connection string varies based on the the language which you use if you are using a jdbc connection the connection string would be different if you are using an odbc connection it would be different so it varies from a language to language framework to framework you want to store the credentials securely the connection string has three parts uh, not three parts it has the ip address or where the database is residing so the ip address it could be an external or an internal ip address then you will have the username password and the database to which you need to connect so all almost like four important information is there and the most important thing is that credentials uh, the password and the ip address is an important thing so if you just keep it in your uh, so i come from a java background so if you keep those things in a very plain text format plain text format uh, like application.properties file anybody who's deploying this if you just just open the file in any editor well they'll be able to know what is the credential there so which is not a good way and even if you just commit it into any uh, public repositories like github repositories if an hacker scans it he'll come to know that so taking that into perspective keeping the uh, credential information specifically the username password plus your ip address in the source code is not a good choice because if it's in source code it will be made visible in the github repository or cloud source repository whatever the repository you're using similarly if you do it in environmental variable also it is it will be in a plain text format the whole intent is if it's in a plain text format it's easy for somebody to see it so make sure you encrypt it in some way so that you can ease it uh, easily use it and also there should be some options of uh, periodically changing this so something like if somehow lands into the wrong hands they should not be able to access it forever so you should have some kind of a key rotation kind of a feature so that's the one which can be fulfilled using your 
uh, Google key management system. So if you look into this uh, documentation, uh, it just does not manage it, but it can also provide you the option to rotate keys. Uh, so you can generate key, use it, rotate, destroy it. So it's a very good option, I would say. Uh, that's a good option. And moving on to the next option, uh, I would say C is a good choice. Let's uh, discuss on D also to just to see whether C is better or D is better in a config file that has restricted access through ACLs. So this is something very similar to the previous question which we had discussed. Use GSUtil or the REST API. Something which is out of the box and something which you need to build uh, with some, there's some base already, you need to build something out of it. So it is something very similar here. So if you are using config file, doing some access restrictions, all those things, you can definitely do that. But the, the main uh, problem which you will face here is you need to manually rotate the keys. Maybe like if you are a very secure organization, usually they will try to rotate the keys every 30 days or very standard practices 90 days once in three months that you need to do it manually but if you are doing it with your uh, kms you can all those things you can automate these things very easy to use it's more of a managed service that's what i would say so that's the reason uh, i'm going with option c here in this case Moving on to the next question uh, for this uh, question we need to refer to the mount Creek games uh, so I already have the cheat sheet, so this cheat sheet, uh, you can see the benefit of referring to this cheat sheet towards the end, make, maybe like just before you are entering your examination center, just glance through this cheat sheet, it will be definitely helpful. So let's see what is the question here. Mount Grid Game wants to set up real-time analytics platform for their new game. Uh, the new platform must need, meet their technical requirements, which uh, combination of Google technologies will meet all their requirements without looking into the options. If you look into the case study, uh, the, the cheat sheet, uh, which was created very long back in the month of March under Mount Grid Games, if you see big data for real-time analytics, what do you need? Streaming data, PubSub will handle it, ETL, data flow, and you want to persist the data and do analytics there, so big query. So all these three components, if it is there, I'm done. I can just choose that and move ahead. I don't even need to look into any other options. So if you see the one which falls under that category is option B. Along with Google Cloud Storage is also there because they want to upload the game statistics there. So that's the reason they're using Google Cloud Storage there. And one more thing, if you have not looked into this uh, cheat sheet for assume, assume you have not looked into it, but uh, at least you will come to know the case study. You can refer to the case study at any point of time in the exam because the way it will be structured is on your right hand, uh, left hand side, you will have this kind of a question. On your right hand side, you will have this exactly the same case study, word by word, line by line. So you can spend good amount of time, maybe like five minutes quickly, or if you're a quick reader, you can go through the case study thoroughly. And what you will realize that is they are using MySQL for reporting purpose. And towards the end, the executives, uh, the CXO people, they say they want to, sorry, if you just come here, they say they want to replace the MySQL. So if it's for reporting purpose, BigQuery is a good choice. And they are saying themselves, they want to replace MySQL. So the MySQL equivalent of that in GCP is what? Cloud SQL. So you can straightforwardly remove options which is having Cloud SQL. Option A, remove it. Option C, remove it. So you are now only left with B and C. Sorry, B and D, if you see that. And if you quickly see it, PubSub is a good choice. Compute Engine. So they would have told uh, the Compute Engine, if you look into the case study, the Compute Engine falls under their backend system. Say for example, uh, if you just go here, uh, they have two technical requirements. One is their backend, one is their analytics. So we are discussing about this part, not this part. So for the backend, you need Compute Engine. And data proc nowhere they have mentioned anything about data proc and you can definitely use a hadoop to do all your uh, data proc stuffs uh, like sorry uh, hadoop to use all your analytic stuffs but more it is like it's more like a managed service but when it comes to bigquery and along with data flow you can almost do it like a serverless option so that's another benefit which you get and if you see here it is more expensive option also but if you look into this option, 
all the four components which we have selected in option B are totally serverless. So that's that's a benefit which which they get if they want a new analytics. And um, if you are using BigQuery, you can also query data live on the streaming data. That is also the streaming insert is there. So that is also a good option. So looking into all those options, if you see and if you see, they also need a data warehouse for reporting purpose. So in this option, if you see, there's no data warehouse. That's another reason why B takes a, a precedence. Uh, and it's more cost effective also nowhere they have mentioned cost effective part but uh, if you look into the entire case study BigQuery makes more sense compared to data proc and you can look into my uh, you do, uh, videos also on mount grid games that will make it very clear so that's the reason we'll go with option b so moving on to the next question the 18th question again for this we need to refer to our mount grid games uh, case study mount grid game has deployed their new backend on google cloud platform you want to create a thorough testing uh, process for new versions of uh, the backend before they are released to public you want the testing environment to scale in an economical way you should how should you design the process so if you see here um, for this uh, if you have gone through the case study very well you will come to know it and uh, what is the main thing is uh, why Mount Good Games are coming to GCP is they were already a cloud customer, some other cloud customer. So if you see my uh, case study here, the cheat sheet, uh, Mount Good Games, the current environment is they were already a other cloud vendor. Whatever the cloud you can take, you can take your choice. It's your choice. Um, the problem, uh, the reason why they came to GCP was it did not scale very well. Say they had some problem scaling. Uh, global customers so that was the main thing so they were already a cloud customer some other cloud customer that cloud did not scale very well so that's the reason they came here now so, so since now came they came to gcp uh, the main important thing is uh, they don't want to do the same mistake facing the problem of scalability so they want to do a thorough testing uh, the infrastructure testing so that it does not break again here in GCP. So for that, uh, they want to do that testing and it should be in a very economical way, meaning a cost effective option. So the first option they are saying is create a scalable environment in GCP for simulating the production load. Simple, straightforward, sleek, which is something possible. If you make sure you provision the right resource uh, and make sure it in such a way that it can scale up and down, Definitely, you should be able to do it in an economical fashion because you are going to do how many, how long you are going to do a load testing. So maybe for one day, maybe two days afterwards, if it can scale down or it can be uh, decommissioned, it would be a more economical way. So option A looks like for me straightforward as a good option, but let's still look into option B, C and D. Looking into option B, if you see, use the existing infrastructure. What is the existing infrastructure? That is the previous cloud. So to test GCP based backend at scale, which is totally a wrong way. The reason is you wanted to test the new infrastructure that is the GCP infrastructure. But if you run everything on your existing infrastructure, it's not going to serve you the purpose. It's defeating the purpose. So that's the reason B is not a good choice. Moving on to option C, build stress test into each component of your application and use the resource from the already deployed production backend to simulate the load. So meaning it's already deployed in uh, production, which is nothing but GCP. And doing stress testing on a production environment is a wrong practice. Usually when it comes to GCP, when you are talking about environments, each environment is one project. So if you are doing load testing on the production, it's a bad practice. So you can ask any testers, uh, load testing team, they usually recommend to have an identical system, but it has it should not be a uh, production system. It should be something like a test environment um, or uh, or a pre-prod environment where they do all the stress testing. So based on the base standard uh, best practice of load testing, doing it on the production is not a good choice. That's the reason option uh, C gets ruled out. Moving on to option D, create a set of static environments, meaning it's very static. So it cannot scale up and scale down. So it's not dynamic in nature uh, to test different levels of load for high, medium and low. So, for example, if you want to do a very high load testing, maybe like 10,000 users for that, you may need maybe 10 virtual machines. Maybe if you want 5000 users to test, you need five virtual machines and maybe for 1000 users, you want one virtual machine. If you have something of this sort, you are making it's not like it's not scaling. 
so it's something very traditional way of load testing so if you move if you move out of this and come with option a which is more scalable more dynamic based on the load it can increase the the workload there like it, it can increase the number of instances to which by which you can load that uh, system so compared to uh, uh, compared to uh, a uh, I would say A is a better choice compared to D option and D is more like a traditional way because where you don't have auto scaling capabilities all those things for testing purpose so that in that scenario people will use those kind of static environments but here we are doing it on cloud and the biggest advantage of cloud any cloud is the scalability we can leverage on that part so option A is a better choice compared to any other option so moving on to the next question which is uh, the 19th question again it is a mount grid game case study so here mount grid uh, game wants to set up a continuous uh, delivery pipeline ci cd process they're jumping into a newer uh, world of devops that's what they i would say from the first line this is not there in the case study you can look into the case study and this is not there so this is something like to give you an idea that uh, definitely uh, the case study questions would be there but something as a futuristic part maybe like if mount grid games or teramers if they want to do something leverage something out of cloud so such questions also can arise so this is a, a proof for such kind of a this thing so that is the whole reason why google has created these uh, practice exams so their architecture includes uh, small microservices the moment microservice comes the thing which strikes me is containers so that's how i have uh, did a mind map uh, and they want to want to be able to update and roll back quickly so if you have microservice and if it is in uh, deployed in kubernetes definitely you have the option of rolling back and uh, updating a previous version all those things are possible quickly and if you keep the container in your google container registry anytime you can do that very easily and you can deploy it in multiple regions because it's one it's a multi-regional so behind the scene if you look into one of my videos where i have talked about gcr and storage you will realize that it is usually a multi-regional uh, storage class so you can deploy it anywhere so that's another advantage of gcr there so those are all the components which strikes me immediately when i look into this mount grid games has the following requirement which needs to be fulfilled services are deployed redundantly across multiple regions in us and europe so if you want something like this simple create two kubernetes cluster a regional kubernetes cluster and make sure the workload is coming from you can use the container image which is stored which is stored in your gcr google container registry that should be something possible only the front end service should be exposed to public internet good possible again uh, you can have two options uh, kubernetes ingress or a load balancer two options are possible they want uh, they can reserve a single front end ip for their fleet of ip address again it is more towards uh, the load balancer option which they are talking so still it is possible and deploy uh, the deployment artifacts are immutable so this is something primarily talking about your container image so and you have multiple images and you don't need to modify an existing image so if you want some changes create a new image and store that in your gcr so these are all something which strikes me immediately without looking into the question uh, options itself because they talked about microservices and that goes in sync with Kubernetes and containers, all those things. Let's look into the options here. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, Data Flow, and Compute Engine. If you see here, there's nothing which you can do with this kind of uh, resources. Storage, Data Flow. I don't think so why a data flow is required. Data flow is primarily a data processing pipeline or an ETL tool, and the requirement does not require an ETL tool in this circumstance. So. A gets ruled out coming to the next option storage app engine and cloud uh, cloud load balancing load balancing definitely can help storage to an extent can help for storing your images but what is that app engine to do with app engine containers does not go there that's very well and if you look into the case study or the cheat sheet the compute model which they were looking was managed instance group now they are going towards a next level of cloud nativity so when it comes to cloud nativity definitely app engine and kubernetes would definitely be a good choice but if you look into this requirement you may not be able to do that part that's what i feel uh, with this option and if it was just app engine 
I could have just gone with that. You don't need to have uh, load balancing and you don't need to have storage because App Engine itself can fulfill all those things which they are talking, but not the last part. So that's what I would say. Um, but they need to rewrite the code, all those things. And um, moving on to the next option, container registry, Google container registry. Why do you need that? To keep all your artifacts there. So it is more like for your uh, container image and use your Kubernetes engine to deploy the workload and use your load balancing to have one single IP address. They are not going with ingress, that's fine. Load balancer should still be able to fulfill what these requirements are mentioned here. And moving on to the option, so I feel option C is a better choice compared to A and B. Looking into D here, Cloud Functions, PubSub, Deployment Manager. None of them will fulfill what you are expecting. And for people who are looking into this video for the first time, App Engine, sorry, uh, Cloud Functions is primarily for deploying one microservice. That's it. And it is on a specific event base. So it's not a complete, uh, I would say, um, Small microservice, yes, but if you have many microservices, that's not going to fly here. You need to have multiple functions and rolling back all those things would be a challenge there. And I don't think so why you need a deployment manager and why PubSub. We are not doing anything with uh, analytics here, uh, streaming data. So PubSub gets ruled out. So looking into all those options, option C is a better choice, which can fulfill all the four requirements which they have mentioned. Moving on to the next question, uh, which is our 20th question, uh, a very straightforward, sleek question. The question is, uh, your customer is moving uh, their corporate application to Google Cloud Platform. Security team wants a detailed visibility of all the resources in the entire organization. You use resource manager to set up yourself as an org admin. What uh, IM role uh, should you give the security team? For people uh, who don't have visibility of what a security team does, usually they do all kinds of uh, security check whether all the best practices are followed or is there any firewall open to the entire world, all those kinds of security loopholes, if there's anything, they check to, uh, they look into those things. Uh, they scan it and see is there everything is fine. So they do it using some tools or they do it manually. So it's their choice. Now, if you look into this, no security team is going to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. They are not going to uh, add a user. They are not going to delete a user or they are not going to uh, provision any other resources. They just want a read-only access. That's very simple and straightforward. If you want something like a read-only access at an organization level, meaning if you have multiple projects and there's one dedicated security team, if you give somebody at an org level a read-only access, you're all done. So that's the crux of this uh, question. So if you understand this, answering it is very, very easy. So option B will look straightforward for you because viewer is more like a read-only role which you get. So org viewer, project viewer would be a good choice, but still let's look into option A. What is option A? Org viewer and project owner. At an organization level, it's perfect. But at a specific project level, if you give somebody owner, he can add users, delete users, he can delete the entire resource, whatever the resource, or he can also provision resources. You are giving him more privilege, uh, him or her or the entire team. So it's not a good practice. So option B, as I mentioned in the beginning, so is a good choice because you are a viewer at all the levels, which is a good thing. They can just scan it. Option C, you are giving him the exact permission what you have. You currently have an org admin. You are making the security team also org admin. So what happens is they can go ahead and create a project itself. They can delete a project itself. They can do all sorts of things there. So which is again a more privilege which you are giving. Moving on to the last option, project owner and network admin. If you see uh, the scope itself is reduced here. It's not at an org level. You're just handling at something at a project level. That too you're giving him owner. It's, it is something very similar to option A. He can delete users, add users, uh, all those things. So which is again a, a more privilege you are giving, but at a project level. But he needs to, the team needs to get a visibility at the entire org level. So that's the reason D gets ruled out and B is a better choice compared to all other options. So B is a better choice. And if you ask me, uh, is there anything much better which you can do? I can definitely say, I would say just use org viewer that's enough you don't need to even do a project viewer the reason what i the reason why i say that is the policies flow from top to bottom the top node is your organization node so after your org node you will have your uh, folder node 
then it comes to your projects and inside the projects you will have your resource so if you make somebody a viewer at an org level he is a viewer at the project level and even at the resource level so why do you need to specifically come and enable a viewer access at a project level you can save couple of clicks or save couple of commands running so the best option if you ask me project uh, org viewer is the the best answer so moving on to the next question which is our 21st question to reduce the cost director of engineering has required all the developers uh, to move their uh, dip, uh, development environment uh, resource from on premise virtual machine to google cloud platform these resources go through multiple start and stop events during the day and requires a uh, state to persist i would say this line is a major it's a most important line for this question you have uh, been asked to design a process of designing the development environment in google cloud platform while providing the cost visibility to the finance team which two parts would you take into care so this is typically a uh, cloud architects role where you need to design something and also you need to keep in mind the cost part so which is a really good choice i would say so there are two parts to this question the first part is stop multiple stop and start the development team can persist the data tomorrow they can come and again they can start from where they left that's one thing and also you need to give a visibility to the financial team saying that okay running these things on, on gcp will cost the organization this x amount of dollars now the first option use persistent disk to store the state fine and start and stop the vm as needed so as most of us know if you create a virtual machine you can by default the let me why don't i show you quickly the uh, virtual machine screen so we are in our virtual machine screen and if you see by default uh, the boot disk would be a persistent disk so you can have either persistent disk or ssd persistent disk based on what's your input output operation requirement and a best practice which is nothing to do with gcp nobody will do any uh, uh, activity on this uh, boot disk because this is primarily allocated for and it's a very small disk uh, 10 gb by default you don't do any installation in it it is something very similar to your c drive in windows so usually what will you do is when you do want to do some activity some kind of workload you have usually you will try to add a disk this is your data disk so this is where all your activity would be there so you will put all your uh, work all your stuff install softwares do some workloads all those things and when it comes to this uh, uh, additional disk the options which you get are standard persistent disk ssd persistent disk and local ssds so standard and ssd are network attached local is attached to this machine it's a machine attached uh, storage this one ssd and uh, ssd persistent disk and per standard persistent disk are network attached storage so one thing which you need to keep in mind is before we go into the question you can choose any of this and if you check for example standard persistent disk and it is of how much size 500 gb you can take a snapshot of this data that's one thing and one thing which is there by default is even if you delete the terminate the virtual machine this additional data disk would be kept as this the disk will not be removed but if you just do this and look into the command line option of it you will come to know that there is something called as auto delete equal to yes you are saying once the virtual machine is deleted delete my data disk also this is something which they don't want and they want the, the behavior which they want is they will stop it start it multiple times maybe towards the end of the day they will stop it tomorrow they will come in and start it so they want to start their uh, work from where they started so that is all they wanted and uh, just an information for you uh, if you choose a local ssd you cannot take a snapshot of your local ssd and another thing if you have a virtual machine with local ssd you cannot stop the virtual machine you can only delete the virtual machine i have a video in my youtube channel where i have talked about it uh, i can put that in the description also if you want so that's another important thing which you need to keep in mind so with all those understanding if you come to this question the option a looks simple and straightforward use a persistent disk store the state there stop it start it multiple times it's going to work moving on to the next option use auto delete flag on all the persistent disk before deleting uh, 
Vm. This is the total opposite. I just showed you a couple of minutes back. If you, we don't want this auto delete because we want to retain the persistent disk so that even if you stop and delete your virtual machine, it is still there. So that is the reason. So that's the reason why option B, it's totally the other way they are saying. So that's the reason why B is not a good choice. We want not to have an auto delete flag there. Apply your VM uh, CPU utilization label and include it in the BigQuery billing export. So what is this totally a jump? This is the second part of the question. So there you need to give the visibility to the financial team, right? For that part, they are giving you this option. And if you look, financial team basically are non-technical people and they don't understand the CPU utilization is 90%, the CPU utilization is 75% uh, they don't understand it. But if you give them something like if the CPU utilization is 90%, the cost is X amount or if it is running at uh, I guess uh, the cost will not be varied on what is the CPU utilization also that's something which we know how long you are using the virtual machine is what it will be costing you so option C is not a good choice at least I would say uh, if you just give that CPU utilization to the financial team they will not understand it so it will look like Greek and Latin for them so they are team uh, people who finally focus on the the dollars spent so this option is not a good choice Moving on to option D, if you see, use the BigQuery billing export and labels to relate the cost to the group. So cost is an important thing. So if you export all the details, if you have 10 virtual machines, the cost of all those things running for a month with a specific machine type, that is something which the financial team will appreciate and they will be able to understand it also. So given the cost visibility between B, C and D, D is a better choice. We still have E and F. Let's look into that. Store all the state in local SSD. Please look into this question very clear, option very carefully. You're storing all the state into a local SSD in that virtual machine and you're taking the snapshot of a persistent disk. There's no connect itself. It's totally a disconnect option and terminate the virtual machine. And as I mentioned, you cannot, uh, even if you store everything in local SSD and you cannot, uh, you cannot take a snapshot and you cannot stop the virtual machine. So the purpose which they are asking is also defeated because this is going to have multiple stop and start events. You cannot stop a virtual machine which is having a local SSD. So that defeats the purpose. So option E gets ruled out because of that reason and there's no connection also. So you're doing all your work on SSD and your local SSD and storing the uh, taking a snapshot of a persistent disk. What's the connect there? It's totally a disconnect there. Option F, store all the state in Google Cloud Storage, export the persistent, uh, sorry, store all the state in Cloud Storage, snapshot the persistent disk and terminate the uh, virtual machine. So what they are saying is, uh, so, okay, if you see um, the format, this is something still possible, I would say, but the order is something slightly different. First, you take a snapshot then move that snapshot to your Google Cloud Storage and then terminate your virtual machine. That should be the order. But uh, since the order is not important, if I assume, option F is still also a good choice. And I also have a video in my channel where I have talked about something very similar. You can look into that video and it is something like a 15 minutes video. And now it's uh, with respect to the financial part, D is proper. And with respect to this part, multiple stop and start event, it is between A and F you need to make a, a judgment. So if you see here, both options are still good enough, uh, cost effective, all those things. I would say storage is much, much cost effective. But if you see here, multiple start and stop, meaning in the same day itself, you may have maybe like 10 times, 20 times stopping the virtual machine starting it for various reasons. But if you every time do this option, ex create a snapshot, export to Google Cloud Storage and then terminate it, the problem is the entire process will take a good amount of time for you. But if you just use a persistent disk, a data disk, stopping and starting should be maximum less than 90 seconds. So many multiple start and stop event is a tiebreaker here. So with which I would definitely go with option A. Otherwise the developers will spend time in only doing this activity, exporting it and then terminating it, which is not a good choice. You will not be more productive there. So A and D are the good choices in my perspective. Let's go to the next option, which is our 22nd question. Your company has decided to make a major version of their APIs 
uh, in order to create better experience for their developers okay there's an upgrade from version 1 to version 2 something like that they need to keep the older version old version of the api available and deployable so they are not terminating their older version which is their version 1 in our case while allowing the new customers and testers to try out the new api so the new customers and the tester should be able to access version 2 and version 1 is not decommissioned that's the requirement that's the message they are conveying here they want to keep both the ssl and the dns record in the same uh, in in place to serve both apis meaning if they are having an ssl certificate plus the do domain something like https uh, colon slash slash www.example.com they want to retain it for both the apis they want to retain it what would you do so before we go into the options i just want to show you quickly how a uh, load balancer can be used to fulfill this requirement i just let me show you that quick demo so i'm in my load balancer screen uh, let's click on create and let's use a https load balancer in this case uh, and that's what they say the customers need to uh, access it right it should be definitely internet facing and in this one the most important thing for that requirement which i feel is say for example if you have a rule a host and path rule something like if it's www.example.com example.com and if it is after that url it is like slash one it would be served from a set of backend managed instance group and if you have something similar but the new version you want something like this so what is the advantage here you are using totally the url mapping here the host and path rules if it is ending with slash version one send it to a different backend if it's slash two send it to a different backend so still both can be accessible uh, they can test it independently if something is buggy with version 2 they can just check version 1 how it is working so it's very easy for the developers and for the testers and even for the customers and the dns and the ssl is still the same here so that is the option so using this host and rule uh, host and path rules you should be able to fulfill your requirement so so with that option let's go into the few options which they have mentioned configure a new load balancer for the new version of the api very simple if you have a new load balancer it will have a new ip address if it has a new ip address you need to have a new dns maybe ssl if you have purchased a wildcard certificate you can use the same wildcard but the new dns has to be created so that is against what is the requirement so option a gets ruled out because of that reconfigure old clients to use new endpoints for new api so what is the problem here if the clients wants to use the older version they cannot use it because you are reconfiguring to all send all the requests to version 2 not to version 1 they cannot change it later use the same old sorry have the old api forward the traffic to new api based on the path so meaning if any request is and url is ending with the slash version you redirect that to or forward that to version 2 meaning you don't give the chance for somebody to check what was how was the behavior in version 1 which is not the requirement because they are mentioning it should be still available if you make this it is not available you are just doing a forwarding so b c d are already ruled out so based on this thing uh, uh, best practice d should be the best choice but let's still look whether it will serve the requirement use a separate backend service for each api path behind the load balancer something exactly what i showed you in this is what they are convening here so option d is a better choice here moving on to the last question the 23rd question <coughs> the database administrator team has asked you to help them improve the performance of their new database server running on compute engine so if i were the data like cloud architect in this case i would have definitely told no to this part itself uh, even though that is not the question here but using a unmanaged uh, service is not a good choice because we have cloud sql here right we can use that instead of installing it on a virtual machine which makes more work to be done by a cloud architect and even by the devops team so it's not a good choice but anywhere nevertheless uh, that's not the question here the database uh, is used for importing and normalizing the company's performance statistics so the database has some task to do here uh, it is built with a uh, mysql uh, running so mysql is a database running on a debian operating system and the machine type is uh, n1 standard 8 
virtual machine with 80 gig of SSD uh, look uh, SSD zonal persistent disk so this is the compute option so that's the stuff so what should be uh, uh, what should they uh, change to get better performance uh, for this system in a cost-effective option instead of me explaining the options what I thought is let me why don't I show you a small demo so since it is on a virtual machine let's go to our virtual machine screen so these are the things the name of the virtual machine any zone should be any region should be fine and they mentioned they are n1 standard 8 meaning currently it is having 8 vcpu 30 gb 30 gb of ram and it is debian operating system that's what they mentioned and they have uh, the zonal uh, ssd uh, which is if you just select this ssd persistent disk what they have currently is uh, 80 gb that is what they say and uh, so this is the exact setup which i have tried to do so if you look into the first option and it has to be you want better performance but it still needs to be cost effective as usual everybody wants the whole world but they want to give the peanuts so same thing cost effective option how do you get it so first part increase the machine type uh, so machine uh, virtual machines machine memory virtual machines memory to 64 GB meaning what they are saying is if you come here look into the cost of it if it is uh, n1 standard it will be almost like which is 30 GB RAM it will be almost you'll be paying 333 dollars and if we just make it as more powerful which is like 64 uh, 64 this is n1 uh, n1 standard 64 so that's what I would say yeah that's the thing n1 standard 64 is what they want look into that cost it's definitely not a cost effective option because compute v vcpu and the memory is definitely the cost part major part of the cost when it comes to a virtual machine so option a gets ruled out we see it by ourselves uh, the next option create a new virtual machine running on postgres so this is something totally uh, uh, not something feasible because i'm not sure how much our workload already running in uh, this thing and i don't see like if you ask any uh, database person uh, nothing much difference you will see between mysql and postgres there could be something very specific changes uh, uh, some specific uh, uh, features which one can support the other one will not support but here that is not the question the question is more towards performance and it's not to say that mysql is not working uh, it's not performance uh, uh, like it does not work in a performance in a nice performance way postgres works it's not that this thing both if you give the right uh, environment definitely both can work in a very effective manner so option b is not a option i would say the next option dynamically resize the ssd uh, persistent disk to 500 gb what does this has to do with uh, the performance for people who don't have an understanding of uh, what this storage can do an impact very simple whenever you have give more storage more would be your disk uh, throughput and your input output operation so more the disk more would be your this thing so that's always a, a standard option uh, it's nothing specific to gcp more the disk storage you give space you give more would be your input output operation and better would be your disk throughput and let's try to do that thing so stick on to and if you see the price if you make it as six, uh, 64 uh, gb of ram it is almost like 1800 1900 dollars let's go back to n1 standard 8 which is 250 and let's do something like this come to our uh, ssd which is 80 make it as 500 before i make it on 500 please look into this number so that is the current thing so the moment i make it 500 you see the IOPS increases and the throughput also increases more if you do it still it will increase so that's the biggest benefit and I also have a video in my channel where I have shown how you can resize it without stopping the instance so you use all those options and you can get the advantage and let's see whether it is cost effective because this is only the storage definitely it will be cost effective from 250 it has just come to 335 which is the best option i would say uh, where is two thousand dollars where is three hundred dollars so definitely a cost effective option dynamically resizing it and the last option migrate their performance metrics uh, 
warehouse to BigQuery. Looks like a totally a jump there. You want it for uh, you. I'm not sure what is the purpose they are using it for importing and normalizing the performance statics. They are using it. They are using a database. Moving a database to a warehouse is not a good choice. So you need to understand the details, thorough details of it. Only then you can comment on it. So and doing a total shift will not be a good choice. But if keep in mind BigQuery is serverless, you may get better benefits. All those things. But more inserts. It's not for transactional purpose. It's an OLAP system, online analytical processing system. So if it is more for uh, data in importing data, all kinds of normalizing stuffs, which may not be a good choice there. So option C is a better choice, and we saw that ourselves. So I felt that the demo was really helpful to judge this. Um, so let's submit it. Option C is a good choice, and let's submit it. The moment you submit it, it will show you you want to check the accuracy of it. Click on it, and if you remember, we had missed two questions, which I thought I will share it, uh, do a comprehensive demo for that later. So we have skipped it. We have not answered those questions. So if you scroll down, uh, you should see the options. All should be green, meaning it's all correct answers which we are given. So this one we did not talk about it. We never gave an answer, so that's the reason it is marked as wrong. Similarly, if you scroll, you see everything which we have selected with a good amount of explanation. Looks like it is all correct. Uh, so if you see, everything looks fine. And again, this one we did not talk about it. We'll talk about that in a separate video. Looks like all good with good amount of explanation. Uh, coming to the last question. Yes, that's also good. So almost like out of 23, we have scored almost like 21. Definitely it should be a pass score, I would say. So so that's the video which I wanted to share today. So primarily on demystifying Google Cloud Architects practice exam. So I also try to give some um, additional tips and tricks, uh, uh, how to judge a question, uh, how to look for keywords. So hope that is helpful. Thank you for watching.